so last time we were uh, discussing uh, some important questions i had uh, finished till this part where we were trying to find out that uh, when we are talking about multiple linear regression whether at least one of the beta are non zero if they, they are at all significant or not uh, so we try to uh, our h0 is uh, said uh, checking if all betas are zero but we can we don't have to do it for all betas we can also do it for some q subset of the betas so equation little bit changes from uh, total sum of squares to uh, rss0 with uh, so rss0 would be the model which has uh, p minus q betas and rss has uh, p betas and if we check an f statistic uh, is closer to one that means that those q betas are not out we had already seen uh, the actual p value and uh, t statistic value so why do we need this F statistic? Uh, so they give an example that uh, if there are 100 uh, predictors, uh, about 5% of the p-values uh, will be below 0 0.05 just by chance, uh, even if uh, H0 is true. So it, uh, T statistic is done on sim uh, single beta, so it doesn't uh, adjust for total number of predictors. So in that case, we want to use F statistic to make sure that uh, at least one of them is significant. And they also suggest that F statistic also doesn't work if number of uh, predictors are uh, more than number of examples. Uh, so, and also say that most of the concepts seen till now won't also work. We can't just use the simple uh, least square regression for that. So, they say we will look into the look into future uh, future chapters for that. Uh, now the next thing is we know that uh, at least one of the beta is uh, significant, but we want to find out that uh, what are the actual important variables. Uh, so for that uh, we can use some different uh, criteria like AIC, BIC, adjusted R square. I think may mention last week a uh, couple of these. Uh, so for that, uh, we would like to try out different subset of the predictors and uh, try different models based on that. There are a couple of different methods. Um, one is best subset selection. So we try all different subsets of predictors, but uh, if there are P predictors, that's order of two raised to P. It's like every predictor has chance zero and one like i mean so in that case it's very many number of models so even if there's just 30 40 predictors it would go around billion models so uh, in that case we don't want to try out this so there is another option is forward selection uh, in that we start with some null model it's just uh, intercept uh, we keep adding a predictor based on some criteria so we start then try to fit all one predictor model. Uh, so there should be P of those models and uh, choose the best one based on some criteria says we can choose the one which has the lowest RSS value. And after that, we have set one predictor. Now there are P minus one predictor left. We continue this and keep adding predictors uh, as long as P values are about uh, as long as p values are below some threshold and once it start going for uh, above some threshold we stop at that time the good thing about this is uh, this would be order p square so first try we try p models then p minus one and continue and if we sum those it will be order p square uh, and this can even be used when p is greater than n so if number of predictors are greater than uh, number of examples we can go up to when p is less than or equal to n and keep adding till that point so this work in that as well another one is reverse of that kind of backward selection where we begin with the full model 
and uh, keep removing variables uh, based on some criteria, say the largest p value. Uh, so we remove one criteria, one uh, predictor based on that, and then uh, try to fit p minus one predictors to the model and keep removing until all the p values are all the remaining variables have p value above some threshold so all the variables which are not included in model if we include them uh, it would increase the p values so we stop based on that uh, there could be combination of backward and forward selection mix mix selection we start with some null model keep adding variables uh, if something goes above some p value we remove that keep adding some other variables and stop at some another criteria uh, so they also mentioned that uh, all of this again will be discussed in chapter six uh, so we might uh, get to learn a little bit more about different methods there as well now uh, another uh, aspect we want to know is how well does the model fit the data so there were a couple of criteria we already seen uh, rsc and r square uh, R square is uh, has some standardized values, so it's easier to compare. But RSC we can also compare if there are uh, model on the same data. So if we see that uh, if we just fit on TV, RSC is three point two six. But if we add radio, RSC decreases uh, substantially, and same as the increase uh, in R square. Adding a newspaper in that doesn't make much change. R square even uh, uh, R square increases a bit, but uh, RSC uh, increases as well, which is not good. So, it, and we can also see this from the T statistic. The P value was uh, higher; it wasn't significant there. So, this matches with that as well. Um, another thing is uh, when we want to actually predict the values. Uh, we have our uh, estimates of beta, but beta estimates have some inaccuracy in themselves as well. So that's one of the what we can see the reducible error part. We uh, talked this in the bias variance trade off in the last chapter. Uh, there is also assumption of linear model. So that uh, adds a little bit of bias because uh, the two model FX might not be linear. Um, and uh, uh, another part is once we fix some uh, I value, we have given some uh, data point, we predict on that, there is a, also a irreducible error, uh, which could be uh, it's uh, our, uh, uncertainty for that specific prediction uh, for that specific I. Uh, so there are, they suggest uh, uh, different uh, intervals for that. There is a prediction interval and uh, confidence interval. Uh, prediction interval would also include the irreducible error. Uh, so it would be a little bit wider than the confidence interval. Uh, they don't give the exit uh, uh, equations for that, but I think I try to find out and these are the equations. Uh, my guess is they are, uh, we have the values of y hat, uh, the, what should I say though? We have the values of the predictions and they, well, might be trying to find out standard errors on that prediction. So this is for the confidence interval, and there is an extra one plus in uh, one plus times MSC in the prediction interval. So it should be a little bit wider. Uh, but uh, uh, I think in R, it's very simple. It's uh, in LM uh, dot predict, we can just say that give me interval equal to confidence or interval equal to prediction. It would uh, give us those values. Uh, now, there are uh, other condition uh, consideration for the models. Uh, we only till now uh, check the qu uh, quantitative variables, uh, but we could have qualitative predictors. So in that case, Oh, our model just, uh, does only work with uh, floats and integers, so we want to encode those. So it's uh, if it's just binary, we could encode as 0, 1, or minus 1, 1. Uh, the interpretation would be a little bit different. So if it's 0, 1, then uh, this is a housing example, uh, the credit card balance example, and we are trying to encode whether someone owns a house or not. So 
uh, interpretation of beta zero would be that uh, ith person doesn't own a house and beta zero plus beta one would be when the uh, ith person owns house. So uh, the difference, which is the beta one is the average credit card balance difference uh, among the folks who own a, among the folks who own a house and doesn't own a house, don't own a house. Uh, same could be done with the three levels and uh, we have this, this could be called the dummy variable or one hot encoded variable. So we, uh, there will be some base variable and there will be some uh, extra difference. So for this one is uh, difference is beta one for between south and east and this one has be uh, difference of beta two between west and east and east is the baseline. So now uh, the next thing would be the extension to linear models. Still now we were uh, assuming that uh, the variables and the uh, case of uh, interaction. So here they give an example in case of TV and radio, we see that uh, errors are uh, positive around this area and also positive around this area, but all the errors are negative. So our model is underestimating, uh, our model is uh, underestimating the values here. So uh, uh, this says that when TV and radio are almost half of, well, there, there is some extra sales going on, the synergy effect is going on. So we can include that with the interaction term. So that would be uh, beta three TV times radio. And if we check the T statistic for that, that shows that it's uh, P value is low, it seems significant. Uh, they also suggest uh, something called hierarchical principle. So that means that if we are including some interaction term, we also want to always include the main term, even if it's uh, not statistically significant. Uh, so radio here is not significant, but we still want to include it in our model because that makes the interpretation proper. Uh, if that's not the case, then uh, interpretation is not uh, straightforward. Uh, so so there is something missing. But oh, another thing to mention is the nonlinear relationship. So that is, uh, we can also have a polynomial terms of our predictors. Um, I don't know. There is something missing from here. Maybe I'll come back. But yeah, it just says that we can also have uh, po polynomial terms of regression and. Uh, because uh, this, we can just uh, assume this is some uh, extra XP. So we don't have to change anything on how we fit the model. It's still linear in terms of uh, uh, our coefficients, uh, but uh, it's polynomial in terms of our axis, uh, our predictors. Uh, they at the end they uh, also discuss some potential problems so uh, non-linearity of the data so oh, we can uh, use residual plots to find that out so these are our fitted values y hat versus uh, our residuals so this would be y minus y hat or y hat minus y so this uh, graph we want that to uh, have a like band around the zero because we assume it's a uh, uh, the errors are normal and uh, normal with zero mean and some variance. Uh, uh, so the, the residual should be some normal distribution given some X. Uh, so that's not the case in this area, uh, the, the, this model. So in that case, we might want to transform our uh, axis. And we did like, uh, we did that in the last, uh, where we did the horsepower square and uh, we can also use some other transforms like uh, log of x or square root of higher degrees of x. 
uh, there could be correlation between error terms are one of the assumption was that uh, error terms are uncorrelated uh, if that's if they are correlated then uh, standard error which we estimate our formulas would underestimate the actual true standard errors and we use that standard error to find out the our confidence interval prediction interval our p values and t statistics so this could cause us to believe our, that our beta is significant even when uh, it is not statistically significant uh, this they suggest that uh, frequently occurs in time series data um, uh, in that case, uh, there are a bunch of methods to mitigate this uh, in time series data. They don't give out any specific methods. Maybe we'll see in future. But for other types of data, they suggest that good experimental design would be crucial in mitigating uh, this kind of uh, correlation between the errors. Uh, Another thing, assumption was of homoscedasticity, our uh, variance uh, of residual uh, would be some sigma squared. So uh, it's called, we assume that it's a constant variance. Uh, and again, we use uh, standard, we get standard errors, confidence interval, our t tests are based on this assumption. So if this is not the case, then uh, this can uh, lead to so uh, that those tests being inaccurate uh, for this one we want to uh, so this uh, as it says that uh, as y uh, fitted value uh, increases our y hat increases our uh, band goes wider here so the the uh, variance is increasing so we want to have some uh, constant width around the line zero so they suggest log y or square root of y kind of transformation. So when value of y increases, uh, it uh, diminishes uh, the residuals a little bit uh, so that we might get uh, something like this one. Uh, another pro potential problem would be outliers. Uh, we can see outliers. Uh, so outliers would be the points where yi is very far from the y hat so predicted value is very different from the y uh, this will affect our uh, rse values because rse is square of this and then uh, square, square root of that uh, sum of uh, square of all well uh, all uh, residuals so uh, so if, if it was just a simple linear regression, we could find out and plot it in just x versus y. But in the case, if, if it's not simple linear regression and it's multiple linear regression, uh, we can also see the same thing when we uh, plot uh, y hat versus residual. Uh, so this uh, 20 is uh, sticking out with very large uh, residual value. Uh, now they suggest that uh, this will depend on uh, the what's the range of y r y, so we might want to normalize that. Uh, so to do that, we divide that by our uh, standard error of our uh, uh, standard error of our residual uh, values. Uh, so if we do that, we get the studentized residuals. So we kind of uh, also uh, applying the student uh, t distribution formula, the t minus uh, the value divided by the standard error of the all the epsilons. Uh, so in some cases, if we assume that outlier was uh, occurred because of some data collection error, then we can remove it. But it could also indicate some kind of deficiency in our model. Uh, another thing I missed that that uh, this shows the red line fitted line is with outlier and the dash line below it is without outlier. So we don't see much difference when we remove the outlier uh, in this case, but uh, it could be a case uh, when outlier is also a high leverage point. So high leverage point are oh, points where 
Xs are not in the regular range. Xs are very out of the range than regular other Xs. So 41 here is a example of high leverage point. So here we can see our linear model is moved a bit. So red one is uh, in the presence of 41 and uh, black, uh, the dash black line is uh, in the absence of 41. So just because of 41 single point our uh, model shifts a bit. Uh, so that's uh, maybe in that case, we want to uh, take care of this kind of uh, high leverage points. Uh, now, this is again, this is simple to find out uh, just by plotting if it's a simple linear regression. Uh, but if it's a multiple linear regression, the axis doesn't have to be uh, one thing we can't visualize just by plotting the values. And other thing is axis doesn't have to be outside of the range. Uh, uh, here, X1 and X2, this point is inside range of X1 and X2, but it's outside of uh, that, uh, we could say joint distribution, I guess. So this is uh, still in, if we just uh, see, simply check if it's uh, between range of X1 is there, it's between range of X2 is there, but combining a higher dimension, it's not in the regular range. So in that, those kind of scenarios, uh, uh, they give us this uh, leverage statistic. Uh, so we want to calculate that and plot that again the, against the studentized residuals. And in that case, the leverage value is very high for 41. So we can see that this is the point which would affect our model very much uh, because the leverage value is very high. Uh, this is the equation for simple linear regression. They don't give out uh, uh, the so equation for multiple linear regression. Uh, but it would be something similar, my guess is some kind of uh, square distance instead of just the square of this. Uh, the value uh, range of this would be, uh, I forgot, but it, the max value would be something like one, uh, but I forgot it's between zero, one or something like that. An average value was something like P plus one by N, where P is number of predictors. Uh, so based on that, we can see that if it's very high leverage point, uh, so uh, another one was uh, collinearity. So if two predictors are uh, collinear, so here is an example of age and limit, which are not collinear, we can see from the graph, but uh, that's not the case for limit and rating, they're highly collinear. Uh, if we see the optimization surface and their contour plots, if they are not collinear, the beta's surface of uh, loss uh, with respect to different beta values would be very more like a squarish uh, ellipsis. Uh, but uh, if that's not the case and they are highly correlated, then the loss surface would be very skewed like this. In that case, uh, we have very small margins or even small change in our sample of the data, we can get some betas which are very different uh, because the this is the uh, op optimal value. And even in small change, we can move around a bit and the optimal value wouldn't change, but beta would change significantly. So here it shows that they compare uh, the T statistics for both the models where one is age and limit. Uh, and another one is rating and limit and rating and limit are highly correlated. So we see that uh, none of them are kind of uh, significant. We can see maybe rating is a little bit significant, but uh, limit certainly is not. Uh, in this case, we can, uh, and this is uh, so what we can see is simple collinear, uh, simple collinearity. There could be multiple multicollinearity where our x i one uh, predictor variable uh, is collinear with three or four different variables. Uh, it did some kind of we can see linear combination of uh, three four different variables. So if that's the case, we can't even uh, 
check uh, check from something like correlation matrix so we can plot pairwise correlation matrix and we can find out from that but multicollinearity we can't even find out with that so there in that case they give this uh, criteria variance inflation factor so in this what we try to do is uh, we go through each of our predictor and uh, that predictor we try to uh, model that predictor with all other predictors so say we uh, there is some predictor xi we try to, we remove xi from the model and consider xi as our y and try to predict with uh, xi with other x's if we can do that then we can say xi doesn't give much information because those information is already given by other x's so we can drop xi so if that's the case those r squares value would be very high so if r square is 0.9 here the vif would be 10 for that because 1 minus 0.9 is 0.1 and 1 by 0.1 is around 10 so when vifs are very high 5 and 10 uh, we can drop some of those uh, predictors uh, to remove the multicollinearity oh i think these were the potential problems um, i'll stop for a minute if there are any questions or anything i think it's just sorry yeah, i i don't remember like what I read about this multi-collinearity, but you mentioned about removing the predictors, right? When they're like, the VIF is high. Is that really like a way like to decide, like, is that anything that goes into the decision-making on what to remove, what the variables to remove? Let's say you have variable A, B, and C, they are highly correlated, like there's a multi-collinearity. Like, instead of like having all three predictors in the model, maybe we just put like one or two, but when do you decide which one to remove? So well, I, I'm not very sure, but my guess would be one would be uh, the VIF value and maybe we can remove which one is the highest one. So one VIF mm. value would be 10, five and two. Maybe we start with 10 and then try to fit one. Uh, another thing I think we can we will see this maybe in the sixth chapter the regularized mm -hmm. methods where it would uh, based on our regularization parameter would might drop or decrease the betas. Uh, so I, I think that might help as well. But again, I'm not very sure. Maybe Ross, you have any insights? Um, so yeah, I think the other thing that um, definitely plays a role, especially if you're looking at, uh, if you're thinking about a model where um, inference really matters, is um, like the theoretical weight of the predictors, right? Because if you have a predictor that's theoretically important to your understanding, even if it has high multicollinearity with the others, perhaps you want to keep that predictor and drop others, even if it, even if they have a lower um, VIF value because of the theoretical contribution of that, that variable. Um, or there's other solutions to, to multicollinearity, like you know, uh, combining things into composite scores or um, you know, progressing on the culprit or other kinds of sort of weird um, workarounds and, and so on instead of dropping things. So I think a couple of things, I think that's one of the things they also say, we can combine the collinear variables together as a single predictors. And mm -hmm. another thing uh, you mentioned, I realized I missed that part. So one of the bad thing about the collinearity is the inference part, uh, because if uh, the two predictors are very collinear, it's not straightforward now that we were assuming that we, keep all the predictors constant and just change one by one unit and see how it changes our uh, response variable. But that's not the case in our data because if limit changes, rating changes with that. So it uh, doesn't uh, work well in uh, terms of inference as well. Okay, um, maybe I will. I think this is the section to do. Yeah. 
Uh, just uh, this should be very quick. It's a comparison with the k nearest neighbor uh, and some little bit of information about parametric models versus non parametric. So in parametric, we assume uh, about fx, uh, we have strong assumption, maybe could be linear, we can assume it's linear, but in clear drive, if it's not linear, then it could lead to poor performance. Uh, the good thing about would be, we just need to estimate small number of parameters. Um, the interpretation could be simple and uh, we can also perform statistical tests like t-test and f-test to check the, uh, significance of our parameters. Non-parametric, uh, there is no explicit uh, FX model. So, so it's a kind of flexible approach to perform re uh, regression. It depends on our data. And uh, in KNN, it highly depends on value of K. So as we change K, uh, we will go big, back into the bias variance thread of realm. Uh, if K is small, we are kind of trying to fit each and every point. So K equal to one would be very high variance and K equal to N, uh, that if we assume that K is uh, all of our examples, in that case, it's a very biased model. So uh, as we go and uh, tune K, uh, we can, we move into that bias various trade-off. Uh, they just give example of uh, if it's a linear model and if you fit with k equal to nine versus uh, k equal to one. So if actual model is fx is linear, then uh, small uh, k equal to nine would be a good idea. Uh, k equal to one would be very squiggly. Uh, this is, uh, if actual model is uh, linear, then linear model obviously will do well. Um, and this is the mean square error of linear model, the dashed line. And as K uh, decreases, because this is one by K, so K decreases as we go along this uh, route. And here K equal to one, our MSC will increase. This is, uh, I think, test MSC. Our training MSC will keep decreasing because we are kind of uh, fitting the noise in the train data when we decrease the K value. Uh, but our test MSC, when we try to find out on some unseen data, it will be uh, it or uh, it will be bad because the variance is very high in the model. Uh, if it's a little bit of uh, squiggly model, like some kind of polynomial degree of three, uh, then. Uh, Initially, when K is uh, in some range, it will do better than uh, linear regression, obviously, because the actual model, actual FX is not linear anymore. Uh, but if it's a highly curved area, or even with higher value of K, it will do very well with the uh, KNN uh, when compared to linear regression, which is this dash line. And I think they also talk about something called curse of dimensionality. So when number of dimension increase, uh, KNN uh, doesn't do well, even in the non-linear uh, boundaries, non-linear uh, regression parts. Uh, so because when P is very large, the neighborhood, when we talk about K and then we try to find out some neighborhood of K similar points and try to predict based on those points. And the, when the dimension is very high, the neighborhood is not the, as tight as we would like. So the points which we find, the K points, which are not very much similar to the actual point which we are trying to predict. So in that case, this curse of dimensionality occurs. And I've seen this, like whenever we, uh, uh, whenever there are distance-based metrics, uh, costs of dimensionality would be one of the consideration. And here to find nearest neighbor, we would use some kind of Euclidean distance or some other L norm. So in that case, um, that's another consideration. I think that's it from the my side. Uh, uh, I think we can move on to the lab maybe. Uh, if uh, there are any questions, if not, then we can move on to that. 
I don't have any questions. Who else do you have questions? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I'm excited for the labs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> so I'm not like, to be honest, I'm not familiar with Dibe models because I don't use it at all. But I'll try my best to present. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, so I just roughly like try to build all the slides. So, um, so what I did was I was just trying to compare the lab with what we have on the ISLR book and the one on the tidy models one. So what is different is like in the book, they usually just run the MESS library and the ISLR, which is that's where you get the data. But for the tiny models, you just run an additional tidy models one. So for today's lab, we're just going to be using the Boston data set. I know there are like controversies regarding this data set, but we're just going to use it because that's the one that you use in the book. So how to explore? Usually like before, like for data wrangling, before any data wrangling, you might want just to explore what's in your data sets, what are the variables. So there are a few options, whether you can use the head, then you just put in the data set name, or if the data set is available in the package, you can use a question mark, then you put the variable name, the data set name. The other one that I really like to use is glance, then you put the data set name, because that one allows me to like quickly look at what is available in there. Then to run a linear regression, I think most of us are familiar where you just use an LM, which is in the base R. So this is usually the dependent variable, which is your response variable, and this will be your predictor. So then you have to specify which data sets you are taking it from. So this is just going to fit the model, the first line. Then if you want to get the output, you have to put in summary of the model, means summary lm.fit. So, as you can see from here, the estimates. Uh, so this is your beta zero. So it decreases, else that it decreases, and it's like significant. So, it's like, okay. So how is different in tidy models is, in tidy models, it seems that they define the engine first, so they put a linear regression. I think this is this is the function. Then and then you set the model as in what you want. Let's say regression classifications for our model. Then you need to set the engine, which is LF. So if you just uh, look into the package, you should be able to find what are the types that you have to put in for this set model and set engine. Next, you want, after you define the engine, so this will not run, you need to specify the equation. So LM fit, uh, just to clarify, so for all anything from the book, I'll just use LM dot fit, then anything from the tiny models, I use LM underscore fit. <laughs> so here, you just specify whatever you have defined previously, then you fit, the models, the equation here. So this is similar to in the base R. So else that, then you predict uh, MDDB. Then after you're done with this, you might want to just get the data out. You can use LM fit and then plug the fit and then summary. Then you can tidy everything up just to get the important variables that you want. But this one, just the third one, should get you enough of the data that you want. So it's more steps if you use tidy models, but it seems that this is useful as if, if you need to change the equations anywhere, you don't have to keep on defining the engine. So it helps you to move from one equation to another equation very quickly, especially if you're like comparing model one, model two, model three. So 
this one is the equations that we mentioned earlier. So the changes is, this is how we define the engine and the output should be similar. So if you just do a summary up to here, this one should be the same as what we get from the LM model. And if you do tidy up, is this second part where they just give you this estimate standard error statistics as well as the p value. So um, then back to the book. In them, they say like once you run the model, you should be able to, if you go names and you fit the model, then you will know what are the information that is stored in the output. So this will be useful as in if you want to like extract the estimates out, you can just, and you're not sure about what are they named under. So this is the function that you want to use to find out the information. So this is coefficient. Let's say you want to get the estimates out for the intercepts, right? So you can just run coefficient, which is here. This is one of the intercept, this one, I think. Then if you want a confident interval, you can just get this confident interval, 95%. So it will be like 25%, the lower bound and the upper bound. Alternatively, you can use the tidy function from the broom. Then it will get you very nice if you just use tidy like what we did earlier. So you can get these estimates. So it's like less troublesome. You can get everything, the estimate standard error statistics and p-value. I use this most of the time, like tidy to get the estimates as well as my p-value out. Oh, this is the glance that you can use as well. And this one should give you most of the data around here. Okay. Then let's say like just now Rahul mentioned about you, we want to do a prediction. So there are a few ways to do the prediction. So one is that you want the interval you specify as a confident one. So you predict this model, first you specify which model that you have run. Then you specify the data frame. Let's say you want to predict 5, 10, and 15, the value 5, 10, 15 using this model. Then your interval, you want to set it as you want the confidence based on the confidence. So that will be your lower bound and upper bound. Let's say for, uh, let's say for 10, this will be your estimates, your Y value, your response. Then this will be your confidence, the lower and the upper bound confidence. Then for predictions, prediction give us more about like, if you use prediction interval, give you like uncertainty about the certain value. Let's say for 10, your estimates is your fit now is about 25, it's still the same. Just that now this one, it provides you the estimates of the uncertainties. So the lower and upper bound of the uncertainties, the range more. Then, but the problem is this predict function in base R will not work in the tidy models, which is the PASNIC package. So in there, you have to specify differently as in you do a predict LM fit, then you have to specify the new data okay, based on the data, then you specify the type. So it's just slightly different. And as in, it will give up instead of giving you like the previous one where we have to specify the values like one by one to predict. This one is more convenient as it gives you a range uh, it predicts the data for the whole Boston data set. So you will have all these, like this lower and the upper bound values. So for me, I use specify five rather than the whole table, but you should get the whole table. <clears throat> so, uh, so this one, after that, you can use this function as in, you can bind the prediction with the original values from the data set to compare how much they differ. So like for example, this was from the real data set. 
and this is our prediction. So they don't differ that much. Or else you can use another one, which is this function of moon. Then it's still the same. You put in the modeling, then you put in the data, specify the data. Then after that, you just select and it should be the same. So these two functions are the same. Just that this one, you bind it from the two so you bind everything up the two data frame up then you select whereas this one you just straight away like it will fit together and you still select so this is the one in the book where they plot versus like lstat versus medical i don't remember medb then you have you can plot XY scatter plot, then X line is where you fit in the model. Then this is the thickness to add linear line. So you just add one. If you use X line, you can should be able to add one linear line. Then ah, this is where we talked about just now earlier. Uh, you want to get the diagnostic plot. You want to check for collinearity, multicollinearity, everything. So then you have these standardized residuals, residuals. So this is how the first one is where they just put it into, instead of getting like one by one run, like a lot of, a lot of plots means you have to write four, four lines of codes just to get each plot out. What they suggest is you can do a matrix, like two times two matrix, then you can just run it. I find it very difficult to read this plot if you do it this way. <laughs> like for me, I prefer the other way, which is I use a package called performance. So once I fit the model, there's a something, there's a function where you can check underscore model, then you can specify and they run all this multicollinearity and they also calculate VIF for you. So I think that's uh, what I prefer. So this one is also to compute, let's say you have this predict, then uh, what is it? you want to compute the predict versus the residual. Uh, and this is, this is the one predict like versus the residual and this one with residual students. So this one is how you want to look look for the leverage stats so you have these head values then the model then you plot okay then you can after that you use the which max of these head values to identify which is the i think it's go by it's not the id but rather the row so this will be row 375 that's the one with the maximum. Then going to multiple linear regression. So similar, if it's just base R, you just add plus. Let's say we want to add on H, you just add plus. Then you do a summary one of the model. Um, or else, if it's like in tiny models, you can recycle this, so you don't have to specify this again. You can recycle, but what you change is just the model the equation here. After that, you just tidy everything up. Then everything else work the same. Okay, shortcut is if you want to go with this one, you just dot, and then everything else will be going to the model. Then to calculate VIF, you just put VIF in the model. And for like tiny model sets, I think you can use update function. As in, you want to update your equation instead of like writing it out again or erase it, you can just update it. Then interaction model, let's go into the tiny models one. So this one I think you for me. So interaction is just the same. You just fit, then you change the equation. But in tidy models, they specify interactions differently as in you can do something like step underscore interact. 
then it's a tilde with the interaction. After that, you have to do a workflow. I'm not sure about this workflow, but it seems you have to specify it first. Then you add the model of what you have specified. Then you add recipe. This is the common steps that I realized that add model, add recipe is the steps that usually they use for dynamic models. So this one is add models, the, the equation that add recipe, which is this one. Then after that, you fit. So for nonlinear transformation in base R, you like let's say polynomial up to like two, three, four, five, you have to specify using this I. Then or else, then after that, you compare models between models using ANOVA. Then you can plot it. Then for higher order, you have to use the poly. So you can specify up to like five polynomials or six or whatever polynomials you want. Then they talk about log transform. You can use the log function to log transform your predictors. Or, but in tidy models, they use stat mutate to log, um, to like, let's say power up like this. So this is to the square. So you square this up. After that, you, it's the same, add models, add recipes. So you don't have to change much of the codes. Then this one is for you to lock transform your predictor. Then for categorical, let's say categorical is, we talk about there are certain like using these car seats that have certain categoricals. So you can use for categorical it's important that you want to figure out the contrast as in you want to know which is the baseline. So what we are comparing against. So there are a few ways to figure out whether you can use a car seat and then pull, then you figure out the contrast. Mm, I think this is about the same. Okay. So for tidy models is for the contrast, you have this stat dummy, then you have to use all nominous predictors means you only want that categorical predictors. And it's very important that you specify that you want that categorical predictors. Then the rest will be the same as previously. Then finally, functions is, I don't think we need to go into it. So if you are interested in function, function should be in the R4DS book because they didn't really go into this. Then that's the end, I think. I try to rush you to the end because you're running out of time. <laughs> but yeah, so that's all. So Thanks, uh, uh, for next week, uh, due to the daylight saving in US, I think. So we will not have the class next week. And we will like meet up the following week. So I think we need to leave or else we'll overlap with other group. <laughs> so see you guys. Yeah, thank next you both. Week in two weeks. See you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.